Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sherry Goodman, and uh, welcome to this event on climate security risks in the Arctic on behalf of the Woodrow Wilson International Center, its Polar Institute, Canada Institute, and Environmental Change and Security Program, and the Center for Climate and Security, we are delighted to welcome you all here this afternoon. Um, we're very excited to have you for this uh, important event. On behalf of my colleague, Mike Zafrega, the director of the Polar Institute, I welcome you all here uh, this afternoon. This is a groundbreaking discussion on how climate security risks, security overall, and changing dynamics are intersecting in the Arctic region. Uh, I'm Sherry Goodman. I served as the first Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Environmental Security, uh, and I'm uh, affiliated both with the Wilson Center and the Center for Climate and Security. I've been working on these matters of Arctic security since the 1990s, and I witnessed the very real environmental security threats in the region, even at the end of the Cold War, let alone the climate era. There are a few places in the world where change is happening more rapidly than in the Arctic. From record-breaking heat waves in the region, rapid reduction in sea ice and thawing of permafrost, alongside a rush of commercial and shipping activities across the newly navigable Arctic Ocean. These changes in climate and human activity already pose real risk for Arctic nations with tensions rising among powers and militaries increasingly interested in expanding their presence and capabilities in the region. And these risks are not going away. If anything, climate change is set to exacerbate the issues that security forces face in the high north, which is why we believe it's so important, given the record and history of cooperation and low tension in the region, to bring together today a panel that will focus across uh, Canada, Norway, and the Arctic on bringing uh, low tension and high effort to this, to the threats we confront today. That's why the Center for Climate Security worked together with our global partners to recently expand our research focus in this region. Earlier this year, we launched two reports touching on climate security in the North. The first, Climate Security in the Arctic, was sponsored by the Norwegian Ministry of Defense and done in partnership with the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs. The second, Climate Security Plan for Canada, was supported by Canada's Department of National Defense. Both of these reports explore how rapidly accelerating climate change will pose unique threats to a fragile and tense region, but also suggest concrete ideas for ensuring safety, stability, and engagement for our Arctic security forces and populations. You'll be hearing more specific details from these reports later in the second panel today of our experts. Above all, it's clear that we need expanded dialogue and engagement among allies and partners to build resilience and cooperation in the region. That's why we're so excited to present today's events, which we hope will be the beginning of just that purposeful dialogue. We are joined today, uh, and I'm very pleased to be uh, moderating this first panel with senior representatives from the three nations whose partnerships will be critical to maintaining Arctic security in the decades ahead, Canada, Norway, and the United States. And we have high level representatives, both the ambassadors of Canada and Norway, are, we're privileged to have them here today, as well as senior representatives from um, Secretary Kerry's uh, climate uh, presidential uh, climate envoy office, Sue Biniaz. I'm going to introduce each in turn who will deliver their remarks. Then I will moderate a discussion uh, with, with all three of the panelists. And then um, after that, we'll move to the second panel of today's events, just so you all have the format. To offer us her insights first, I'm delighted to welcome Her Excellency, the Ambassador of Canada to the United States, Kirsten Hillman. Ambassador Hillman has been Canada's ambassador in Washington since March of 2020, having previously served as acting ambassador and deputy ambassador. So she's well-skilled and prepared for this post. Before joining the Embassy of Canada to the US, she led the position of Assistant Deputy Minister of Trade Agreements and Negotiations Branch at Global Affairs Canada, overseeing all of Canada's trade policy and trade negotiations. She was also Canada's chief negotiator for the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for the Trans-Pacific Partnership. 
Ambassador Hillman has held various positions at home and abroad, including Associate Assistant Deputy Minister of the Trade Policy Branch and Senior Legal Advisor at the Permanent Mission of Canada to the World Trade Organization in Geneva. Before joining Global Affairs Canada, Ms. Hillman practiced law, studied at the University of Manitoba and McGill University. I'm being a recovering lawyer myself, Ambassador, I won't hold that against you. I will give the floor to you uh, and very excited to have you here today. Thank you so much, Sherry. It, it's great to be here. Um, and I'm very happy to be here with you, uh, with Ambassador Foots and uh, with Subina. It's a, it's, a, it's a pleasure to see see all of you up on my screen. Um, thanks to the Wilson Center and the Center for Climate and Security uh, for this event, which I'm, I'm really looking forward to. I'm looking forward to this part. And I'm, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to the next panel as well. Um, so today's discussion from, from our perspective is very timely. Just a few weeks ago, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau and President Biden uh, got together and they established a roadmap for future Canada US partnership in the years to come. And there was a heavy emphasis in that partnership on um, our need for ambitious action on climate change and our need for renewed and strengthened cooperation in the Arctic in all respects in terms of human security, climate mit uh, change mitigation, um, and also social uh, and community uh, related cooperation. So, so a really great time to, to be joining you to talk about that and Canada's North in particular today. Um, if I could start, let me just start by giving you a little bit of information to, to um, position our North and its place in the Canadian identity for you. Um, so our North is vast. It represents 25% of the global Arctic and consists of actually 40% of our domestic land mass. Uh, its population is, is very small, but it's 50% Indigenous uh, overall, with some parts being up to 85% Indigenous populations in, in Canada's North. Um, we all know that the Arctic is warming at twice the rate of the rest of the planet, but for Canada's Arctic, it's actually warming about three times faster than the global average. Um, as such, our Northern communities, our Indigenous people, they are facing the greatest threats from the impacts of climate change uh, within our communities. Uh, they're affecting, obviously, their local infrastructure, civilian infrastructure, but of course, as part of our topic for today as well, military infrastructure, um, their sources of food, their sources of water, and in, in important ways, physical and mental health of these communities. Its impact on wildlife, for example, has had an, a very negative effect on um, traditional hunting and fishing and herding activities. Um, th and these are the activities that are not only sustaining from a food perspective, but obviously deeply important from a cultural perspective for, for our peoples. Uh, the opening of navigation routes is going to further affect some of these very fragile ecosystems. And at the same time, uh, maritime travel is becoming more challenging. We've got areas where the ice behavior is making passage more dangerous, which can affect delivery of vital supplies. We're putting a lot of emphasis, um, in fact, announced just a, a few months ago, additional emphasis on ensuring that we can get vital supplies to these communities through airlifts because the waterways are so volatile and, and, and difficult to access often for many communities as a result, in fact, of climate change and, and changing ice patterns. Um, in addition to human security risks, of course, there are strategic military implications for, for our Arctic. And I think that you know, these new navigation opportunities uh, together with advances in technology, we all see have, have spurred a growing interest and I'll say a growing competition uh, in the North. These, um, this is uh, a situation that we are looking at very carefully with our Department of Defense in cooperation with other partners, including NATO, um, and, and having to really consider what kinds of steps we need to be taking in the light of um, the changing environment and the strategic 
challenges and security challenges that that could potentially pose for, for our country and our, our allies. Um, so with awareness of all of these threats, there's a lot of different things that we are doing coming at this from different directions. I mentioned the Canada US roadmap, um, but we also are, we have um, issued in September of uh, 2019, an Arctic and Northern policy framework. This framework uh, and policy document was co-developed with indigenous communities, with our provinces and with our territories. Uh, and it's intended to guide federal action from now until about 2030. Obviously, you know, these, these policies are often refreshed and renewed, but it is a long-term vision of the policy that we need to be taking up in the North. It's focusing on a number of things, obviously climate change abatement, um, creating healthy and resilient communities, looking at the security of the people, looking at the safety of our people, from, a, from a, a physical safety perspective, and as we say, sort of strategic uh, and military issues as well. Um, we are looking for ways in which to um, increase the climate resilience of these populations so that they can adapt in, as they most obviously are going to have to do and are already having to do. Um, focusing in on protecting Arctic biodiversity um, focusing in on reducing greenhouse gas emissions uh, very significantly up in the north as well. We're also, you know, we're working very locally within our own communities, but we recognize that international cooperation and all of this is going to be essential, sharing information, sharing expertise, sharing experiences, sharing, sharing you know, burdens in a very fast evolving complex environment. Um, so reports such as the, the climate and security plan for Canada that we're going to discuss a little bit later, I think is, is incredibly helpful to us to be able to um, have, have, have a look, if I can put it, have an outsider's look at what we are doing and, and bring some of those perspectives to bear. Um, our colleagues in, in Ottawa and our experts are, are looking at that report carefully and, and are eager to, to engage in uh, discussions around its recommendations. I think for us, a key takeaway from that report is the continued need to leverage the knowledge that we gain um, through the co-development of our strategy with our Arctic communities, um, but also with international partners. Um, and I think that that and, and international partners from a science, from a dispense, from a social um, resilience perspective, all of these areas, these are these are challenges that are best faced um, in, in a community of people who are seeking the same objectives. Uh, and also we know of course that the Arctic Council is looking at a lot of the human security threats for the Arctic and uh, the council's working groups, Canada is actively engaged and will continue to be so and continue to press for indigenous participation in, in the work of the council. Um, and in addition, we were one of the 54 states that uh, raised this issue at the UN Group of Friends on Climate and Security last month, calling for a number of measures to be taken in the Security Council on Climate Change. We think that that is, is, is very important. Um, and finally, as I mentioned, working with our, our NATO allies um, on the specific challenges posed by climate change with respect to security in the North. So just maybe finally to, to spend a little bit of time on Canada-US cooperation in particular, not to put my Norwegian friend, uh, of course, who we're, we, we cooperate well with in, in all sorts of areas, but given that we've just concluded this framework between our leaders, um, I think that something that really stands out for me in as we were developing that framework and as we were sort of bringing it to, to a head with our leaders is that on the issue of climate, uh, given our deeply, Canada US is deeply interconnected, of course, economies, but, but also more importantly, ecosystems, waterways, um, you know, airflows are deeply integrated environments. For us, uh, a lot of the discussion around climate change cooperation is a discussion around domestic measures and what we're doing domestically and how that either impacts in a positive way, an amplifying way, or potentially, if not well coordinated, 
can undermine the efforts of one country, one of us or the other. And I think at, for the Canada-US partnership, that is something very important to internalize as we go forward. And so as we saw in, in that roadmap, there's a lot of the uh, elements that were in there that had to do with domestic measures on climate policy, whether it's the energy sector, emissions regulations, incentivizing electric vehicles and our electric vehicle partnership, our battery partnership, critical minerals, supply chains, these kinds of things that if we, if we are able to do them well together and in coordination, as I say, we're going to have an amplifying effect on each other. Um, there was a, a virtual event hosted by the embassy last week, and um, a Special Envoy Kerry made a presentation, and he, he said exactly that. He said, when it comes to uh, climate change, the fates of Canada and U.S. are, are very deeply linked, um, and that, that is true, and it is, it's, of course, back to the, the, the topic of this conversation today, that's very, very true in the Arctic as well. So uh, we really look forward to the rest of this conversation. I think that in, uh, just to conclude, I think that I would say, I'd just like to say that um, for us, the challenges that climate change is posing to the safety and security of our Arctic and its people is a crucial and immediate issue. And we have to keep front of mind, or we, we keep front of mind, the fact that that is the, the youngest and fastest growing population in our country up north, which is in itself quite, quite um, positive and encouraging, but it also means that our responsibility towards the region and its people is ever more important. So uh, I'll, I'll stop there. I really do look forward to the rest of this discussion and uh, working with all of you as we move these terribly important issues forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Hillman. That was um, a brilliant uh, set of remarks and I think really laid the groundwork well um, and discussed all the dimensions of um, Canada uh, in the Arctic, but also the US-Canadian partnership over many, many years now uh, on so many issues uh, from trade to human security, environmental security, and uh, military security and beyond. And um, you know, we've been cooperating together with Canada and with, with Norway and others in, in the high north on climate security issues now for a number of years, now that the US is back and has rejoined the Paris Agreement and has put its climate ambition very clearly on the table um, in a variety of um, uh, pronouncements from um, the president's very ambitious climate executive order and many other uh, announcements recently, the partnership with Canada, um, and others and the, the vice president's uh, recent meeting with the Norwegian prime minister. Um, it's, uh, it's front and center really in everything uh, that we do. And we want to ensure that both the challenges of climate in the region uh, are addressed, but the opportunities to improve human security, uh, to reduce risk uh, and to transform the energy sector uh, and improve resilience are all addressed uh, as we um, as we work together. So thank you for sharing uh, that with us. And it's now my pleasure next to introduce uh, Ambassador Norwegian Ambassador Krutnes uh, for her remarks. Um, and she has served, uh, Anakin Romberg Krutnes has served as her country's ambassador here in Washington since September of 2020. She's a respected expert in security policy, law, law of the sea and Arctic issues. So she's perfect for this discussion, trained with the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs um, and served as Deputy Director General of the Department of Security Policy. Uh, and she was Norway's ambassador for the Arctic and Antarctic. Uh, so she's a very dear friend uh, of ours in all of these discussions. And I should know personally, I have worked for many years with Norway going all the way back to the 1990s through Arctic military environmental cooperation uh, with Norway, Russia, and the United States to help uh, reduce nuclear waste streams at the end of the Cold War from Russian submarines and have had many opportunities to work with her and her colleagues and know the strength um, and the depth of the professionalism um, that she and her colleagues bring uh, throughout uh, their work. She holds degrees from the University of Oslo and the Norwegian School of Economics 
uh, and we're very pleased and honored to have you with us today, Ambassador. Thank you, Sherry, for that wonderful introduction. And, and thank you to the Wilson Center and the Center for Climate and Security for this event. It's, it's a, really a timely event, as, as my colleague from Canada said. Well, as, as an Arctic country, we uh, have in Norway a front row seat to, to see the effects of the climate change. Um, and, and we see that uh, the Arctic is warming uh, twice or even three times uh, the global average. Uh, we see the sea level raise. We, we feel the air temperatures. We see the glaciers melting into the ocean. And, and let me just say, and you know that, but I think it's important to say that these changes are not uh, directly linked to the activities in the Arctic. Um, they are predominantly due to activities and emissions from the rest of the world. And um, that is why the Paris Agreement is so, so important. And that is why we're so happy to see you back in the Paris Agreement, uh, dear uh, USA. Uh, because when it comes to climate change, everything is interrelated. And, and what happens in the Arctic absolutely affects the rest of the globe but it's also vice versa. Um, to us, uh, the Arctic is not a remote and mysterious place. Um, I was listening carefully to Kirsten's uh, layout of, of their Arctic. Um, we have 10% of our population living in the Arctic. And um, it's a place where we live and work. Um, some of our most innovative industrial areas are in uh, the Arctic. And the climate and ecosystem is also very different from the American Arctic. We have the Gulf Stream that makes our waters ice free. So it's a, it's a huge difference. Um, the report, I, I look carefully at the report uh, and uh, we talk about the different scenarios. And what comes very clear out from the report is that we have to integrate the climate risk analysis in any planning we do for Arctic. And, and that uh, I think is a very clear message and a very sensible one. Uh, we have to take the climate risk into account in all of planning. Um, then I want um, to say a little bit about uh, what a report does. It, it, the report raises questions about the governance structure of the Arctic and whether today's structure is resilient enough uh, to the changes taking place to climate change. Um, I would argue that it is, that today's um, legal regime and the existing institutions give us the framework we need to continue our cooperation for a secure and a stable Arctic. Uh, but we will, of course, have to work for that. Nothing comes from itself. It will uh, demand hard work and, and further development of these institutions. The changing climate leads to opening of the ocean and, and access to resources. Um, it can lead to more tourism, more commercial traffic. Um, and from a security perspective, uh, one concern is that uh, large parts of the Arctic will still have great empty distances, poor communication, extremely rough and changing weather conditions, fragile environment. And these concerns must be addressed. And, and as I said, I think they should be addressed within the legal and institutional framework that already exists in the Arctic. Um, the Arctic is governed by international law. Uh, most important one is, is the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, uh, which as you probably know, it defines the territorial waters, the economic zones, the continental shelves for the coastal states. Everything is readily laid out and there is no race for the resources or the ownership of the Arctic because it is already regulated by international law. And uh, in 2008, um, the five Arctic coastal states met in Greenland in Ilulisat uh, to sign the Ilulisat Declaration where they agree that uh, the Arctic is, is governed by um, uh, UNCLOSED, uh, the Convention of the Law of the Sea. But they also, in that declaration, describe the Arctic as a unique ecosystem. And they emphasize the need for cooperation in scientific research, for navigation, pollution, 
accident prevention, search and rescue, and the protection and preservation of the fragile marine environment. So that was a promise given by the coastal states in 2008. And then you can ask, what have they done with that? Well, I think one example is uh, the Polar Ocean Fisheries Agreement um, that was made just two years ago. Uh, because in the polar ocean, there is um, an area in the center, roughly the size of the Mediterranean Sea for, for a European, that's a reference point, um, which is not covered by any economic zones of any state. So it's high sea, free to go, except today it's covered in ice. There's no commercial fisheries going on there now. But um, in order to be ahead of development, those five coastal states, um, together with other fisheries nations, agreed that in the future, no unregulated fisheries will take place. Uh, we don't know if there will ever be any fisheries there. Um, uh, today it's ice, uh, in the future, the huge depths of the water, uh, we don't know if there will be an attractive fishery, but if there will, it will be regulated. And I think this is an excellent example of the coastal states taking seriously the responsibility they have for management of resources uh, in the region. I'll also very briefly uh, mention that um, the three agreements that have been negotiated under the auspices of the Arctic Council, uh, one on oil spill preparedness, one on scientific cooperation, and, and one on search and rescue. And I think those three agreements uh, are a proof of the Council's ability to be relevant uh, and to develop international law as needed uh, as circumstances change. Um, you also have the International Maritime Organization that has developed a polar code, um, which is also a sign that international cooperation um, uh, developing uh, law for the region. Um, I'll try to not continue too much longer. Uh, just a few words about the military development that we see in the Arctic. Um, that is also mentioned in the report. Uh, let me first say that I don't see the military development as a direct result of climate change, uh, just so that is, is clear. Uh, but what we see is that uh, over the past decade, Russia has re-established much of its military infrastructure in the Arctic. It has modernized, strengthened its military forces. We see an increase in their exercises and activity, and this poses a challenge to NATO. Um, it poses a challenge to us as their neighbor, but we don't see it directed towards us, but towards NATO. And as a response, we see allies and partners increasing their presence in the North Atlantic and in the high North. Uh, and that allied presence and activity in the region is important for Norway uh, because uh, it adds credibility to, to NATO's collective defense and, and our ability to work together as an alliance in, in the high North. Uh, we just have to, to make sure that we maintain this very careful balance between deterrence and reassurance. Norway does that balancing act towards the Russians every day. We want to show our deterrence, but at the same time, reassurance. And, and NATO must also preserve that balance in the North. Um, there was mentioned, uh, Kirsten talked a lot about the bilateral relationship between Canada and, and US as neighbors. Uh, we cooperate with our neighbor, Russia, uh, on practical issues uh, related to coast guard, uh, border guard, search rescue, incidents at sea, fisheries management and protection, nuclear safety, as managed by, mentioned by Sherry, all these things. And, and I think that our bilateral cooperation with Russia on these practical issues is also part of the picture in the North to, to keep the region stable and, and predictable. Um, I'm running out of time. Uh, if not, I would have said a few words about China. Um, there's a lot of interest of China in the Arctic. Uh, we see them there um, for the moment, mostly for research uh, and interest in the new shipping routes. Um, they have invested, uh, but they are not a military factor in the Arctic. Um, I will round off by just mentioning that Norway is now on the Security Council uh, of the UN, 
and that we have put uh, climate and security as one of our priorities at the Security Council. Uh, so I will I will leave it at that because I see my time is running out. But um, uh, just to, to round off, um, the climate change is a huge challenge uh, for the Arctic. Uh, but we have to continue to work together to uh, achieve peace, predictability, stability in the Arctic. And, and uh, we should do that within the existing legal framework uh, that governs the region and, and the regional cooperation that, that we have first and foremost in the Arctic Council. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. That was a terrific and very comprehensive uh, tour de force uh, of uh, Norway, NATO, the high north um, and uh, relations with uh, Russia. And thank you so much for underscoring, uh, of course, the importance of the existing institutions and their role in providing stability uh, and the cooperation uh, among uh, NATO partners and allies. And noting uh, that the climate risk analysis conducted um, in this report that underlies our event today in many ways parallels the uh, President Biden's call in his executive order for the US Department of Defense to conduct climate risk analysis regionally around the world. So this is becoming uh, essentially a way of integrating climate into the security planning structure to integrate it. Um, as you say, it's it's not climate that has, has is directly caused Russia to rebuild its military infrastructure, but as it does so, and as we evaluate the region, in its total balance, we need to account uh, for the changing climate and how to be better postured, as you noted, for search and rescue, increased fishing opportunities, um, and uh, other changes uh, in the region. Well, now it's my great privilege uh, to introduce uh, Sue Biniaz, uh, who works with Presidential Envoy John Kerry at the State Department. Sue and I have actually worked together um, over many, many, uh, many decades. Um, she, uh, she's got deep experience as the lead climate lawyer for the US State Department. She's played a central role in all major international climate negotiations, including the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. Um, and during her tenure at the State Department, she served as a deputy legal advisor. I think during that time, Sue, you uh, advise on the legal portion of the Arctic Military Environmental Cooperation Agreements uh, back in the 1990s. You also supervised the treaty office in issues related to law of the sea, Somali piracy, Western hemisphere, human rights, law enforcement, and private international law, and served in the State Department's legal office for oceans, environment, and science, as well as the legal office for European affairs. Really, Sue has done it all. Um, so we're very pleased, um, Sue, that you're able to join us today on behalf of uh, the State Department and uh, the Biden-Harris administration. Uh, thanks, Sherry, and thanks to, the, um, to our co-hosts. So uh, you asked me to say a few words, not specifically about the Arctic or climate security, but about the international climate policy of the new administration. So I'm gonna try to do that. Um, many of the elements of the policy are found in the early executive order of January 27th. So if you look at nothing else, you yep. know, that's the best thing to look at. Uh, other elements have evolved since then or are still evolving, and I'll mention some of those. So I think it's helpful rather than go through you know, 27 different elements to conceptually group them into four baskets or buckets. Um, first is getting the U.S. back on track. Second is exercising US climate leadership. Third is raising global climate ambition. And fourth is putting climate at the center of US foreign policy and national security. Now there's obvious overlap among some of these. The more the United States can get itself back on track, the better position it is in to exercise climate leadership. And obviously a purpose of exercising climate leadership is to raise global climate ambition. So there's you know, lots of overlap among these categories, but <laughs> Roughly speaking, the first one, getting the US back on track. The key elements of that uh, basket are the following. Rejoining Paris, and we can put a check mark next to that one. 
the instrument um, of acceptance was signed on day one. 30 days later, on February 19th, the United States became a party again. Second element um, is the NDC, or nationally determined contribution. Parties to the Paris Agreement are supposed to maintain a national emissions target. Um, once we withdrew from, from the Paris Agreement, we sort of assumed that our uh, pre-existing NDC slid off the table. So um, the executive order said, get started immediately developing the new one. And the EO uh, says that the US aims to have the next one ready uh, in advance or at the um, president's climate summit, which I'll mention in, in a minute. Um, the third element of getting back on track relates to climate finance. Again, the EO says, get started right away putting together a climate um, finance package. It's something that the US was not uh, great on during the last four years. The US walked away from part of its pledge to the Green Climate Fund, um, et cetera, et cetera. And then the last element in that bucket relates to the Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol on the phase down of hydrofluorocarbons or HFCs. Uh, the EO directed the State Department to get the package ready to send um, to the Senate, gave them 60 days to do that, and those 60 days have almost expired, so I expect that package will be done soon and sent over to the White House um, for next steps. You know, unlike most situations involving treaties where often legislation comes after the Senate approval process, in this case it actually happened the other way around where Congress uh, passed an act at the very end of last year called the AIM Act, which actually includes the functional equivalent of the phase down in the uh, Kigali Amendment. Therefore, if Senate um, advice and consent were to be forthcoming, the US would be in a good position to uh, be able to implement. So that's basket one. Basket two is uh, exercising climate leadership. Uh, first element, the appointment of the first ever special presidential envoy. We've had special envoys, but this um, is a sort of uh, raising up of the, of the profile. And of course, the person uh, in, in, the, in the form of John Kerry is also, um, you know, uh, to be taken notice of. Uh, the second is to reconvene the major economies process. That is an interesting um, grouping because it was started under the Bush administration under the name of the major economies meeting. Uh, it's the same countries since then. They represent about 80% of global emissions, population, and GDP. It was continued under Obama with a slight name change to the Major Economies Forum, basically discontinued or sort of uh, dormant during the Trump administration, and uh, it's being revived under this, this administration. Uh, the third element is to hold a climate summit. That was one of the campaign commitments, to hold a leader level climate summit within the first 100 days. Uh, it's now scheduled for just within 100 days, Earth Day, April 22nd, spilling over to April 23rd slightly because of you know virtual time zone differences. Um, and basically it's going to be one stop shopping so that a portion of the uh, the leader level summit will be the reconvening of the major economies forum. Uh, finally, in this exercising leadership bucket, we have uh, making it a, climate change a priority um, and integrated it, integrating it into both bilateral diplomacy and a, and a wide range of international fora. And the executive order actually spells this out, basically acknowledges that climate is relevant to many fields, not just climate per se. And it includes some of the fora where the last administration didn't really want the words climate change to appear at all. Um, so those would include the G7, the G20, the International Maritime Organization, ICAO on civil aviation, various ocean related fora and, and relevant to today, the Arctic, which is um, expressly mentioned there as well. Uh, third, basket in terms of raising global climate ambition. I'll just go into a little bit of detail there, maybe a minute's worth. You know, Paris Agreement had the objective of limiting temperature rise to well below two degrees while pursuing efforts, quote unquote, to limit it to 1.5. Um, and Paris also said that parties should aim to achieve a balance between emissions and removals by the second half of the century. That's equivalent to the concept of net zero emissions, balance of 
emissions and removals, but second half of the century. Well, what happened a couple of years later was the IPCC report on 1.5 degrees, which made much clearer that we need to increase the scale and speed of climate action. So in other words, it became clearer that, you know, as between well below two and 1.5, we need to be leaning closer to 1.5. And in terms of achieving net zero within the second half of the century, we need to be much closer to 2050 than let's say 2100. Um, the other things that happened post Paris were um, that Paris had encouraged parties to revisit their nationally determined contributions uh, in 2020, but 2020 didn't happen as, as planned. There was no conference of the parties because of COVID and a lot of countries sort of waited to uh, enhance their NDCs. So it puts, a, it puts a quite a bit of pressure slash opportunity onto 2021 because all three of these things will be, I, I would say, you know, addressed um, and um, dealt with. Temperature goal, uh, timeline for net zero emissions and increasing 2030 targets. So, and I'll quote um, roughly Secretary Kerry here on those three issues. He's basically said that the goal for the Glasgow COP should be to leave a 1.5 degree temperature limit uh, within reach or not foreclosed. Um, so that's in terms of the long term. He's also pressing countries, at least the major economies, to commit to net zero emissions no later than 2050. In other words, the first year of the second half of the century, which is what the Biden administration has committed to domestically. And to be specific about strategies for getting there. So not only to commit to the goal, but to say, here's how we intend to, to get there. And he's also seeking enhanced 2030 uh, NDC targets and Another way of putting that is, you know, increased action within the decade of the 2020s. Um, so, you know, he has been, and I guess I would say our whole team has been actively involved in <clears throat> climate diplomacy in the last several weeks, um, both to align on goals and to try to raise ambition, particularly among the major economies. As Ambassador from Canada said, we've done a leader level uh, statement with them and have been engaged with Norway um, as well, Canada and Norway are both our umbrella group partners within the UNFCCC process and obviously have longstanding climate relationships with both of them. On the last point, just to end um, in terms of the fourth basket on the centrality of climate to foreign policy and national security, uh, the executive order makes very clear as a matter of, I guess, policy and, and rhetoric, if you wanna call it that, that it basically just says <laughs> climate change is at the center of foreign policy and national security, lest there be any confusion about that. But then it also operationalizes the point. As Sherry mentioned, it uh, tasks out ver various reviews to the Defense Department. It tasks out a uh, national intelligence estimate to the, to the DNI on the impacts of climate. Um, it, uh, it doesn't say this in the EO, but uh, as many of you probably know, Secretary Kerry sort of sits on the National Security Council in his own right, which is again, a, kind of an indicator that climate and national security are being uh, melded. And just last point, um, Secretary Kerry has given a number of talks related to climate and security in the last couple of weeks. One was at the UN Security Council, where the UK held a leader level event on climate and security. And, you know, those remarks are online. And he also gave a, uh, a, a talk to the Munich Security Conference a few weeks ago. So I'll stop there. And I hope that was somewhat intelligible. Thanks. Sue, that was uh, terrific. A great, uh, a great tour of uh, America's renewed uh, climate ambitions and objectives, but also ways uh, to engage with our allies and partners. And just picking up on your last point, because as you know, very near and dear to my heart, and working over for at least the last decade and a half on climate change as a threat multiplier and ways in which uh, our national security and foreign policy communities should address seriously uh, climate risk analysis in foreign policy and national security planning and the, and the national intelligence estimate and uh, much more. And I think that is a whole new, um, opportunity uh, ways in which our um, military community can lead by example in that um, energy transition and the goals of achieving net zero 
uh, in the electricity sector by 2030 and in the economy as overall by 2050. So thank you um, for laying that out. And now I'm going to um, uh, engage in, in a brief discussion. I think we actually only have five minutes, so I'm only going to get to do one question each uh, with this terrific panel. And I must say, it's a great privilege. Here we are, all women uh, working at the, the forefront of uh, climate and diplomacy. And I think we're all either active or recovering lawyers. So there you go. Um, uh, so let me ask, uh, Sue, let me start with you. Um, since you mentioned uh, the Climate Leaders Summit, uh, coming up on uh, Earth Day. Uh, can you preview the summit at all um, with respect to our uh, partners here today, Canada and Norway, and particularly, um, how do you see the subject either of the Arctic or climate security overall playing uh, a part beyond what you have already mentioned? Uh, yes, I mean, the, the agenda per se is still being finalized, but I can give you four themes, if that's at all helpful. Uh, one, it would be, um, and this is obvious from the fact that it's got a major economies component, but, um, you know, which has always been very mitigation oriented. So uh, first theme would be new efforts by the major economies to reduce emissions during the 2020s uh, to, to help keep the 1.5 limit within reach. The second would be mobilizing public and pri private sector finance to drive the net zero transition and help um, the vulnerable countries adapt to climate impact. So that's you know the finance bucket uh, and adaptation. Um, third would be job creation and other economic benefits of climate action, which would include helping workers and communities affected by uh, the transition. And that obviously ties into um, you know, domestic priorities of the US and I think other countries. And the fourth bucket would be innovative technologies. So on the specific issue of climate security, um, we can, I guess, I guess I can assure you that that issue will feature on the agenda without saying anything more. Hope that's enough, thanks. Yeah, no, that's great. That's great, Sue. Um, Ambassador Hillman, um, if I could uh, turn to you um, and, and ask you uh, perhaps to share uh, Canada's goals, both for this upcoming Climate Leaders Summit and how you would like to see, uh, if you would like to share some ways in which you think the US um, should further engage with Canada on some of the climate security issues that we've been discussing today. And I'll note that NORAD, of course, we work together additionally in NORAD uh, and NORTHCOM. And I, I understand that we're actually working on an updated strategy uh, with respect to our cooperation there, including in the Arctic, which may be uh, uh, available soon. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thanks very much. Well, I, I think in terms of the summit, uh, I think that all of the, all of the components that, that Sue has mentioned you know we're very we're very committed to engaging uh, across all of those areas and, and objectives. I think from our perspective, one of the things that that has been very important for our country over the past a couple of years in De well a year or so in December we um, we adopted a, a new suite of domestic climate actions um, and targets. And in order to do that in a way that would work for Canada, we had to really work hard to make sure the operationalization of those targets was clear to Canadians, clear to our subnational governments, clear to our industries. You know, we have industries that, that will be uh, undergoing significant transformation and that creates important domestic issues for, for, for Canadians. And so in order to, Canadians are very, very worried about climate change, obviously, but they're also very worried about economic stability and jobs and, and communities. And so it was, it was very important for us to have a, a broadly consulted and then legally uh, legislated plan to get where we need to go on um, uh, reaching net zero. And so I would just say for us, um, talking about the objectives that countries have and talking about the concrete plans to implement them and really making sure that we are all speaking you know, yes, it, it, it's important to push ambition and to be aspirational and to push hard, but it's also important to be be clear about 
making sure we all are going to get there. So that's a, I say that in addition, of course, to 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 the financing piece and and, and the other pieces. Um, in terms of security issues, I guess I would say briefly, and I know that we're we're short on time. One of the things that 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 I've come to understand is for our operations up in the north, um, we have our military that is um, uh, challenged by the fact that on the one hand, uh, accelerated permafrost degradation is having important impacts on their infrastructure. So there's an infrastructure piece to some of our challenges in the north. Volatile extreme weather conditions are increasing demands on our domestic emergency response capabilities. A lot of that capability is supported and the search and rescue is supported or run through our military. So they have those demands on them. And then of course, as I was saying earlier, um, we have uh, keeping a, a close eye on the increased interest activity and traffic in the North from, from a security perspective. So there, there is, is, is a community of, of people, our, our military um, colleagues who are being pulled in many different directions at the same time. And I think in working with our American colleagues and our other Arctic colleagues up North, understanding all of those different pressures and how we are, we are responsible for addressing them all um, and how we can do so in a way that is going to be effective and efficient, I think is gonna be really important. Thanks. Great, thank you very much, Ambassador Hillman. That, that was um, a, a great uh, addition to this discussion. And I'm gonna give Ambassador Crudeness uh, now the uh, last word and, and question um, to ask you as you know a very important uh, NATO ally. And I had the privilege of attending NATO's first strategic foresight workshop on the Arctic in Oslo uh, in 2019. And I noted yesterday, uh, the NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg gave a set of remarks where climate was front and center and the role of NATO in addressing climate risk throughout the range of its operations, but also including, of course, the high north. Uh, perhaps you could address, uh, share your views about NATO's continuing role in this, uh, on these issues. Yes, I, I would be happy to do that. Uh, and, and I think as my colleague uh, Ambassador Hillman said, um, the military or, or the forces, they are very concerned about um, the, the changes. And, and I think that is twofold. One is what can they do to avoid further um, uh, contributing to emissions and to environmental damage. Uh, um, and the other one is, of course, all the challenges we see coming because of the climate change, and they have to take that into account in the planning. Um, and and uh, I think it's uh, high time that NATO as an alliance, as a collective, uh, look into uh, these challenges. And uh, I'm sure that the Secretary General uh, will do a wonderful job on this together with the colleagues there. But, but um, this is something we will just have to work more and more on. Um, so um, um, this will be taken very seriously and I, I'm happy to see the progress of the work being done by NATO on this. But it will also have, we'll also have to do it each and every one of us. It's not only for the Alliance, but each of us in our own military forces have to look at this. Exactly, yes. I couldn't agree more that each of us need to look at both um, all, all elements of, of improving resilience, of uh, mitigation, of improving military effectiveness while reducing emissions with um, increased use of a variety of, of uh, diverse and renewable energy uh, sources and renewed collaboration. And I would note in closing the very strong partnerships that um, the, the US has had over many years with both the Canadian military and the Norwegian uh, military. And we of course hope that will continue to extend on uh, climate and security cooperation. Uh, and with that, I'm going to uh, thank you all for participating. 
Uh, and it's now my privilege um, to turn the uh, floor over to my colleague, uh, Kate Guy at the Center for Climate and Security. And let me thank in advance all the panelists on the next panel who I have worked with, uh, Marisol Maddox and Nina Borgen from the Norwegian Ministry of Defense, uh, John Conger and Shiloh Fetzik from the Center for Climate Security and, and Ola Jakob sending uh, from the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs. Thank you all for your um, work and uh, over to you guys. Thank you so much, Sherry. Uh, thanks uh, for your leadership on these issues for decades, as, as well as your wonderful moderation of that discussion. Um, and, and thanks uh, an incredible amount to our high-level uh, speakers for engaging so sub substantively and, and honestly and uh, interestingly on these issues. Uh, it's always a good sign, I think, when each speaker is rapidly taking notes on the ideas and thoughts of their fellow panelists. Uh, so it was it was great to see that. And, and I do think this is hopefully the first of many conversations on these issues uh, among these countries going forward. So it's great to, to be a foundation for that. Um, so now we want to transition into a bit more detail, uh, even more than we just heard, uh, to, to learn from our subject matter experts on the specific climate security risks that we're finding in the Arctic region and what those look like going into the future in the decades to come. Uh, this discussion will build on the two reports mentioned earlier by, by Sherry at the top of the, the discussion. The first is uh, a report on the climate security risks in the Arctic. Uh, that that Center for Climate and Security and the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs uh, did together. Uh, the second is a climate security plan for Canada put out uh, around the same time earlier this year by the Center for Climate and Security. So I encourage you all to read these documents. Um, uh, they are incredibly fruitful, uh, speaking biasedly. But one important thing and, and overarching lesson from both of them are the very real risks posed by climate change already to security and safety in the region. Um, but also that, that more importantly, these risks are increasing over time. The further we allow the world uh, to continue its current trajectory of high emissions, the more security risks we will have to, to deal with in the region. And, and that is really the future that, that uh, the, both reports are saying we need to plan for, both in terms of quickly uh, and safely uh, reaching net zero, as, as uh, Subini has said, but also in terms of all of the security decisions we're making being oriented around climate change as an underlying variable uh, that the region is, is experiencing faster than the rest of the world. So we have so much to discuss uh, in that and a really great group of people to help with that. In the interest of time, I, I am going to forego uh, the lengthy biographies of each panelist. Trust me, each is uh, distinguished in each of their respective fields um, and just introduce you to them, you to them by their current affiliation. Um, and I'll also say, especially for, for those joining us today, we have, I think, over 800 <laughs> people joining the conversation, which just speaks to the pressing and timely nature of these discussions. Um, and I think the demand for climate uh, to be integrated better into security discussions, into discussions about the Arctic, et cetera. Uh, but for all of you turning in, um, we direct you to ask questions uh, via Twitter or via email. So you can tweet at Polar Institute um, any questions, or you can email them directly to polar at wilsoncenter.org. Um, so we'll, I'll be seeing those and, and try to uh, thread a, through, a few of them through our conversations. So first, let me pass it uh, to uh, a deep expert in her own right, uh, Nina Borgen, who is the Deputy Director General and Head of Section of Security Policy Analysis uh, within the Security Policy Operations Department at the Norwegian Ministry of Defense. Um, Nina, really, really keen to hear what you have to say on these issues. Thank you so much, uh, Kate, and uh, good afternoon to you all. Uh, first of all, let, let me thank you for uh, the Wilson Center and the Center for Climate Security for this uh, discussion, and also for, uh, for the interesting and insightful report produced uh, together with uh, the Norwegian Institute of, uh, of International F uh, Affairs uh, on Security in the Arctic. Very timely subject and uh, uh, of uh, great interest uh, uh, in the Ministry of Defense in Norway, but also uh, uh, now also informing our discussions uh, within NATO on climate security. Uh, I would like to underline three points. First of all, uh, climate change is one of the, our defining challenges. 
it is a threat multiplier uh, and it is changing the le level of activity in the Arctic as uh, many of the, the speakers have, have uh, underlined uh, today, uh, both the commercial and the military. Uh, but as uh, Ambassador Knutnes uh, underlined, uh, the increased military activity in the Arctic is not due to climate change, but as a function of geopolitical rivalry and competition. And I think that's important to, uh, uh, to have in mind uh, when we speak about climate security in, in, in the Arctic. Secondly, climate change and the melting sea ice will make it harder for militaries to carry on their tasks. That, I think that's important. And one, uh, one example of that is uh, actually for the Norwegian Coast Guard uh, that has important uh, tasks in maintaining sovereignty and patrolling in Norwegian waters. Now uh, fish, uh, they are migrating uh, further, farther north. Uh, there is fishing activities finding place now uh, north of Svalbard, even in the winter time, because of receding ice levels. That expands the area of operation, both of civilian and military actors. That actually also uh, uh, puts pressure on, uh, on resources as, uh, for instance, Coast Guard on search and rescue, uh, and also increasing expectations of increasing both commercial activity, tourist uh, uh, activity, uh, will then put pressure on, on uh, SCAR's capabilities in terms of uh, search and res rescue. Um, so uh, this is uh, very important to, uh, to take you into account. Um, uh, especially when we see the unpredictable weather systems and harsh operational environments, uh, this will uh, remain challenging even if uh, climate change uh, is also increasing. Uh, the third uh, point I would like to, uh, to mention is also what kind of role for the militaries in environmental and sec uh, climate security. Uh, I think uh, it's in uh, uh, also referring to Sherry's uh, question about NATO's role in, in this. I think uh, as the, the uh, armed forces has uh, have an uh, important role in de decreasing emissions and doing what they can to also uh, conduct operations in an environmental uh, friendly way. And the Norwegian Armed Forces has imp implemented a number of targeted uh, uh, ways of reducing emissions. And this is one of the issues that the NATO Secretary General is uh, keen to uh, increase uh, both situational awareness about security, now climate security, but also uh, uh, what that uh, what implication that has for the armed forces and for NATO forces. Uh, so this will be also a Norwegian priority uh, in taking that uh, taking our responsibility also for climate change. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nina. It's it's fantastic to hear from all of these partners um, at the country level, how integrated climate change and climate objectives is becoming to security policy, not just in the Arctic region, but more holistically. Um, and I think that's that's the exact sort of uh, interaction that we want to see more going forward. Uh, let me now pass it to uh, our, our partner and, and co-author um, and deep expert in the space um, from the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs is Ole Jakob Sending. He's research professor and director of research um, at NUPI. And, and Ole Jakob, over to you for your thoughts. Thank you so much, Kate. And uh, thank you all for, for organizing this uh, very timely event. I've listened with great interest to, to the keynote speakers. And I think they all underscore the not only the fact that uh, Arctic security is changing, but also that it uh, has implications for how we think about the relationship between military and other parts uh, of, of the government. I'll, uh, I'll follow Nina's lead and then focus on three points. Um, the first is that climate change really introduces uh, a need to adopt a societal security perspective on both foreign policy, but also security policy. And that's because climate change, maybe in particular in the Arctic, increases the chances of disasters and accidents. So the challenge is both to prevent and manage those disasters and accidents, 
but also, and importantly, preventing these accidents and disasters to spill over and become contentious political issues. And the risk of that is increasing uh, when the Arctic is, is changing uh, because of uh, climate change. Now, the second, as we detail in the report, is that climate change does not directly uh, impact on the security situation in the Arctic because that's mostly determined by the relationship between the, the states and the pre-existing tensions between them. But increased civilian and commercial activity in the Arctic also means two things. First, on the positive side, increased opportunities for cooperation and to come up with reassurance uh, efforts vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, for example, Russia, but it also, and quite importantly, opens up the possibility for so-called gray zone operations, which takes us far beyond the, the standard military uh, toolbox. This leads me to my third point on institutions that Ambassador Krutnes mentioned. And I think the author, myself and the other authors of the report would agree that one can work within existing institutions, but then they, these would have to be strengthened and adapted to a new situation. Because if you think about gray zone operations, that means, for example, it will be important with screening of operators, screening of, uh, sorry, of commercial activity and investments. It also means integrating climate relevant risk assessments which in turn, I think, requires the development of new tools. And even more importantly, it means hiring staff, building up staff that are competent to assess climate relevant risks in both the military and defense uh, ministries, but also in foreign ministries and in relevant international and regional bodies. So I think the Arctic Council now has an minimal secretariat of 15, 16 people. Uh, you could imagine the Arctic Council becoming a hub for the collection of that type of expertise and knowledge, it, it, but it would then have to be expanded quite considerably. Finally, the, the broader picture here is that there is now so much discussion at the European level about climate change with European uh, Green Deal and uh, basically uh, a revamping of the basis for economic growth that will at least potentially change some of the political that dynamic uh, in Europe, but also between the EU and its partners. Uh, you see that the private sector is adapting to many of these uh, new regulations that is coming out of Brussels, but it also raises the question of what body is best suited to develop new regulations and standards that are relevant for uh, security in the Arctic as it pertains to climate change. And it's not necessarily a given that NATO is always the best institution to handle that. It may also be the EU, which of course raises questions, question for, for Norway, which is not a member of the EU. I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ol Jakob, and, and thanks to you and, and Nina, our Norwegian colleagues, for tuning in late on a Friday evening. Um, hopefully you'll have a, a nice spring weekend to look forward to after this. Um, and Ol Jakob, I think uh, a point that you made, which is so important, and one that I, I've seen governments around the world really struggling with, is the fact that there isn't a lot of capacity across the, the militaries, across uh, foreign service, to understand and, and strategize in this new space of climate security, that it's it's a real dearth of, of issue, in part because the, the threat is just accelerating so quickly, of course. Um, but I liked that, that you said that one way that, that we need to adapt our institutions and, and build out our institutions is by making them hubs of expertise among scientists and security experts and the rest. And I think hopefully our, our report is a testament to that, um, but one that we really need to build on quickly in the research and government space. Uh, let me now turn it to, to Marisol Maddox, another of, of our co-authors and Arctic analyst at the Polar Institute with the Wilson Center, research fellow with the Center for Climate and Security. Um, Marisol, what, what are your thoughts on all these issues? 
Great, thank you so much, Kate. Um, thank you to Wilson Center for hosting and this event has been so fantastic. Um, I've been taking notes the whole time and really enjoying it. So, um, so yeah, so I've been asked to reflect on the report that we had done for the Norwegian Ministry of Defense, but then I also wanted to kind of draw in some points just from the larger perspective of looking at Arctic and climate security work. Um, and those three points are that a future that is characterized by uncurbed warming is an extremely dangerous one on multiple levels. And that is the first point. The second point is that there is an emergence of a slew of actorless threats like climate change, biodiversity loss, ocean acidification that are challenging some conventional ways of thinking about security issues and that they really do pose an unprecedented threat, but it is also actually a really unique and unprecedented opportunity for cooperation on something that really is a shared security concern. And then my third point is that um, specific to the Arctic, that with increased activity in a more accessible Arctic, that um, you know, civilian, commercial, and military activity, that this does increase the need for governments of the region to be able to shore up the ability to manage that increased presence and to decrease risk that's associated with it. So to my first point, uh, we are currently at 1.2 degrees above pre-industrial levels of carbon in the atmosphere. And we urgently need to limit that to 1.5. Uh, the Arctic, of course, is warming at two to three times the global rate. And so we are seeing those changes occurring faster. But as was mentioned earlier, this really is a, something that needs global engagement because it's a, a the sourcing is not exclusive to the Arctic by any means. Um, and also to that point, the difference between a low or high emission scenario, which I think is very clear in the report, is basically the difference between a changed world to which we can adapt or a world in which states are continuously scrambling to keep up with escalating and destabilizing changes and potentially losing legitimacy in the process if they're not able to dependably, dependably meet the needs of their citizens. And we're seeing that, I think that will be a global issue, especially in more fragile states where we're seeing non-state actors that are challenging state legitimacy. Um, so on my, my second point, so as uh, Ambassador Krutnitz had noted that global engagement is absolutely crucial um, for climate change action. And so this is where I want to mention something that, you know, we've really talked a lot about this top down um, approach to climate change, which is absolutely critical. We need government action um, really aggressively providing that that leadership and kind of long term um, vision for what we're working towards. But on that same note, I think it's so important that we're also understanding that like the need to be building up the bottom up capacity for dealing with climate change and also really specifically seeking to empower the people at the community level to be engaging productively on climate change issues in a way that makes them feel like they have agency in this work and that this really is a, a global citizen effort. Um, and that's not only important because of the aggregate effect that all of this individual action and individual communities doing work would contribute to reducing climate change risk, but it's also really important for the from a mental health perspective. And that's something that I do not think is talked about enough because we're gonna be dealing with these issues for a long time and we need children to be growing up in a world where they feel hope for their future so that they can then be productive contributing members of society. And that's something that is not, you know, it, that doesn't necessarily always present itself in the higher level conversations, but I think it's a very critical element that we can't lose sight of. Um, and I also think that that's where communications is so important. Um, even like the whole 
um, motto around the Apollo mission, you know, like we do this not because it is easy, but because it is hard. If we really change the narrative on climate change where we're simultaneously educating people and conveying the urgency, but coupling that with actions, not just at the government level, but at the sub-state level, I think that that is something that could really engage people um, in a way that where it's like, you know, taking this challenge on head on. And I think that's a really healthy way to, to try to envision, you know, what is it that we're working towards? Like, what does success look like? And how do we convey that image of hope to people? Um, and then just my, the third point, so about activity in the Arctic. Um, so this does mean in the near future, figuring out a formal mechanism for dialogue among all military actors in the region. So something like this military code of conduct for Arctic forces, which we mentioned in our paper for the Norwegian Ministry of Defense, or um, potentially adapting the code for unplanned encounters at sea, which has also been suggested, but just some kind of formal mechanism to be reducing risk associated with increased military activity. And then um, I, oh, so actually on that point, so Ambassador Hillman had talked about overtasking. Um, Nina and her remarks had mentioned that about um, Coast Guard um, being tasked to do more. And I think especially for a country like Norway, where the Coast Guard is part of the military, that that is, there does have to be a sensitivity to the potential, especially in an uncurbed warming world uh, for that overtasking to really be problematic. Um, and then in regards to um, Ambassador Kruness's points about the successes of the Arctic Council, which is absolutely on point and is the Arctic Council is, I think one of probably the most inclusive governance structure that we see or intergovernmental forum because of the way that they incorporate permanent participants and have different voices at the table. However, um, the Arctic Council really is limited by lack of authority to do more than make management recommendations. And so especially when it comes to um, looking at something emerging like the Central Arctic Ocean and the governance that will be required uh, to manage that region in a sustainable way, that's where there's some questions about is the Arctic Council able to adapt or is perhaps something additional needed? Um, and then it was also interesting to note in the Biden Trudeau roadmap that recently came out, uh, they specifically mentioned Arctic governance. And so I think so something like the Central Arctic Ocean would be a great piece to pick up um, for, for that goal. So I'll hand it back over to you, Kate. Thank you so much. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Marisol. Thanks so much. And, and thanks for raising what I think are the really important issues, both of, of Arctic and, and threats there, but also threats just to humans and our, our mental health. And, and all of us researchers working on these issues day in and day out certainly feel the weight of, of that often. Um, and hopefully we can figure out ways to, to move forward on all of these issues in a way that is safe and sustainable at a personal level as well as a global level. Um, but let me finally pass it to, to Shiloh Fetzek, um, who can hopefully bring in the, the Canadian perspective as well as a larger perspective, because the, the great thing about the report we did um, on Canadian risks is it's not just Arctic um, focused, it's, it's focused in general about climate security risks and how an entire country, an entire nation should be thinking about uh, those, those threats and possibilities. So Shiloh Fetzek is a senior fellow for international affairs at the Center for Climate and Security, um, eager to hear how, how you see the, the work you've done on this engaging into this conversation. Well, thank you, Kate. Um, the approach that I took to this question around opportunities for managing climate security risks in the region uh, reflects a lot of actually what Ambassador Hillman said, and I think I'm going to bring it to a more um, practical level, <clears throat> following again <laughs> with the three points that other colleagues have done. Um, <clears throat> clearly, climate security and climate policy in general are, are kind of having a moment now. And I think that this opens up some opportunities for as governments operationalize these plans for climate security risk management, they can really learn a lot from each other and share good practices and uh, what's worked. 
And it also can be uh, a basis for strengthening alliances for climate security risk management, not only in the Arctic, but elsewhere. And so the climate security plan for Canada that we developed uh, really centers around good working group practices and making great use of the expertise in the existing policy uh, that's there that treats Arctic uh, security risks in a really comprehensive way. So uh, with all of this uh, focus on, on action in this space and closer cooperation and, and diplomacy around these issues and uh, Canada-US cooperation, uh, one very practical point around NORAD modernization um, is around uh, the information sharing, burden sharing that Ambassador Hillman mentioned, but looking beyond uh, the air domain in defense of North America and to collaborate on other domains as well. So for example, uh, the information domain, uh, to take an all domain approach to these, to an evolving threat landscape uh, and the way that adversaries in the Arctic and elsewhere are also taking a very um, all domain approach uh, to strategic competition. Uh, just as climate policy and climate security are having a political moment, I would say that there's also a kind of social and cultural moment happening right now around awareness of historical legacies and, and justice issues. And it raises a question around uh, whose security are we talking about in the Arctic? Uh, and that can, I think, reflect in some of the resourcing questions and how we see the threats and, and approach risk management. And uh, infrastructure has come up. <clears throat> and uh, I think another opportunity for risk management is around multi-purpose infrastructure in the Arctic, developed very in very close coordination with uh, communities there to support their resilience. So not only looking at, at transport infrastructure, but communications and technology infrastructure as well uh, that, can, that can support uh, operations and capabilities and capacities in the Arctic, uh, both for military and civilian actors that can increase domain awareness and support environmental monitoring, uh, which in turn supports more comprehensive risk assessment. Um, and looking at these issues in a way that strikes a balance uh, to avoid creating additional vulnerabilities when these technologies might be bundled together between civilian and military uses. So those are just a couple of, of practical opportunities um, that we can see. Uh, and I will close there, thanks. Thank you so much, Shiloh, for, for making what's often a very rhetorical and, and high level conversation actually concrete uh, as the report does, I think, as well as, as we need to increasingly force ourselves to be is actually practical with these, these conversations as well. Um, so we don't have much time left, uh, but it's such an incredible group of, of people and expertise. I'm gonna see if we can maybe go a, a few minutes long and, and have some good discussion amongst ourselves because I think it's an important moment for uh, getting to light some of the difficulties and, and ideas to move forward. One thing I wanna pick up quickly is, um, you know, Marisol, you spoke of this. Uh, Liaka, you spoke of this. We heard um, different perspectives on this earlier. But we know that Arctic security is changing. We know that the environment is changing. We know that the, the pressures and, and threats facing forces in the region are changing. But does that mean that the, the institutions there need to change as well uh, to handle that change? Um, uh, are we able to sort of use our existing architecture uh, of overlapping treaties and, and councils, et cetera, in the region to the, the best extent to handle this change? Do we need new institutional uh, uh, creation to, to handle the change? Um, you know, this is important for the years to come. It's also important in a post-2030 world um, if, if we follow along the increased activity trajectories that we're seeing just of commercial activity in the region and, and shipping and whatnot. So let me, uh, Ole Jakob, since, since that was your quote, let me put it to you first uh, for your thoughts on those institutions um, and what we need and then pass it to the others. Uh, I think anyone who's followed discussions among governments about reforming international organizations. They know that that's very, very difficult to do. So it will, I think the, your question will depend on how much success uh, can one achieve in reforming, expanding, adapting already existing institutions because that's certainly preferable to building new ones. But 
it will depend on how much success one will make on that score uh, in the next few years. Because I think if that doesn't happen, pressure will increase to establish new uh, institutions, which, which may just contribute to the uncertainty and fragmentation of the governance structure. Um, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Shiloh, you've worked in, in many of these institutions. You've probably uh, beat your head against many of them as they are slow and, and gridlocked at the international level. What are, are your thoughts on, on what new or, or improved mechanisms we need to handle climate security threats, whether in the Arctic or more broadly globally? I think having a good flow of information uh, and designing structures that are able to absorb such an evolving situation especially as the climate science becomes ever more terrifying. Uh, having that kind of research policy interface and having a strong physical science component to the social science research as well is something that I don't think we have um, mastered the art of yet. Uh, and being you know, responsive to evolving situations on the ground. I mean, I think that there will be a lot of emerging political will for better understanding and addressing this issue. Uh, a lot of the kind of uh, difficulties of doing that effectively have been raised with regard to staffing and so forth. Um, but I think, you know, having more effective fora for exchanging ideas on what's, what's worked uh, and, you know, best practices can also, I think, help to trim some of the fat and make these processes more, more efficient. Of course, the, the flip side of that being that the, this new emerging strategic reality will create all manner of new types of, of competition and ways for states to pursue their interests in different ways. Um, but I think we have a kind of a, a sweet spot period in which um, we can try to kind of reestablish common, uh, common goals and and as I say, kind of share best practices on this. Absolutely, thank you. And that's a great segue to, to Nina, who I was going to ask a, a version of that question, which is what is, is sort of needed among militaries to cooperate better on these risks? You know, Do you have the tools that you need and the toolboxes that you need to handle these? Or, or how, are, how are militaries thinking about how to get up to speed with, with the changing dynamics? Thank you so much, uh, Kate. Uh, I think it's a very pertinent uh, question and also noted with, with interest your uh, your proposal of a military uh, code of conduct in the, in the Arctic, and I would like to comment on that as well. I think it's important to underline that the uh, the Arctic is not uh, an institutionless uh, the space, and that there are many overlapping uh, different kinds of cooperation that reinforces um, uh, our mutual goal of stability in the region and uh, for Norway it's always been important to also uh, to uh, uh, consult and uh, discuss Arctic security issues within the alliance that has uh, the, where the North Atlantic Treaty actually has an area of responsibility that reaches uh, 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 towards the North Pole so this is um, uh, uh, the Euro-Atlantic space and, uh, and that's important why Arctic security also is on the NATO's agenda Agenda. So that is one fora that we uh, that has increased its uh, attention on Arctic security uh, the last couple of years, and of course uh, the Arctic Council has been mentioned uh, is uh, still a, a very successful um, uh, institution, uh, but of course on the military side it, it doesn't have any component, and uh, from a Norwegian perspective that has served us well. We believe that the security is much more broader, and as I mentioned in my intervention earlier, um, this is not about the Arctic as such. Uh, the cooperation and rivalry that we, the uh, competition and rivalry that we see now is, uh, is not uh, something about the Arctic, but so it's more uh, geopolitical development and a broader uh, security question. So, uh, so we don't believe that it's actually for Arctic kind of uh, for us to discuss this uh, uh, solely. We need to do, do this in a broader perspective. 
On the military code of conduct, I think it's important to recognize that there are a lot of mechanisms that we have to, uh, to um, control uh, military activity. Uh, Annikin Krutnes, ambassador, mentioned in her in, uh, intervention the important role of incidents at sea agreements that many allies have um, uh, and that I also uh, have uh, discussions with uh, Russia on a regular basis. Norway does that annually. Uh, it's important to uphold these kind of uh, agreements to maintain stability uh, in the high north. And we believe that these kind of mechanisms are, um, should be uh, updated, uh, should be uh, reinforced to be able to mitigate and uh, 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 the risk of escalation and also incidents in the high north. So uh, it's important to underline that there are a lot of foras that would discuss this also so uh, among uh, the chief of defense in the, uh, the Arctic. Uh, so I think that uh, this needs to, to uh, continue. We need uh, uh, a better understanding of the dynamics in the high north and also to discuss openly uh, also with Russia um, the situation uh, uh, and uh, our both uh, uh, the common uh, interest that we have in maintaining peace and stability in this region. Perfect. Thank you, Nina. And, and Marisol, I know you've worked on these issues so much. We're a bit over time now, but I want you to have a word on, on what you see as the, the future of institutional capacities in the Arctic and, and where you see things moving. Great. Thanks, Kate. Um, yeah, so just going off of what Nina was saying, I would definitely uh, support what has been articulated in numerous events, which is that there is no legal vacuum in the Arctic, and I in no way, you know, want, I want that to be very clear. Um, there are some external time sensitive forcing situations that are coming about, such as looking at, um, you know, 30% um, ocean conservation by 2030, the um, biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction, the BBNJ negotiations and that agreement. There's um, question currently about whether the Arctic Council would qualify as a regional body within BBNJ. And it, because the Arctic states have primarily really wanted to have, um, to, be, to be able to manage the region um, I guess primarily with those states and not having so much global presence or influence, I think that then can puts the the urgency more on the Arctic Council to really look at you know these governance issues that are emerging and how can it adapt or you know what does that look like and because right now the status quo isn't really sufficient for the way that things are changing and what that means for just the evolution of governance for the region. Um, and then additionally, um, you know, just in terms of there are mechanisms for adjudicating different maritime disputes um, that unclose, even though the United States has not ratified it, we do uh, observe that as customary international law. So that that provides a very strong legal framework for the region. Um, but I, again, I guess, especially looking at the Central Arctic Ocean um, Fisheries Agreement, I think that's a really compelling case to kind of look at some of the challenges to the current governance uh, structures that are in place um, and that just need to be dealt with. And I would refer you to um, work that David Bolton has done on looking at some of those issues and how can we strengthen these governance regimes? Because that's really important for also conveying stability um, and, and just uh, reducing uncertainty in the region, which is increasingly important as the region is experiencing so much change. Thank you. That's that's fantastic. And yes, uh, uh, other scholars at the Wilson Center and Center for Climate and Security have been looking at exactly that problem. Um, so it's tough to leave the conversation here, especially when we've uh, only just started, I think, finding common ground. Um, but I guess that's a good place to leave us all wanting more and hoping for further dialogues and discussions, as I think every speaker has recommended creating um, in, in this area. So thank you. And, and thanks, Marisol, for giving us what I think is our, our final thought 
here overarching all of this, which is the status quo is not enough, right? The status quo on global climate effort is not enough. The status quo um, on our institutions in the Arctic is not sufficient. They are uh, fantastic and, and wide ranging, but need themselves to be adapted. Um, and the status quo for how our militaries and security actors understand climate change is also not enough to fully keep our population secure. So with that, let me pass it uh, for some final words to uh, the, the Canadian report co-author, but more importantly, director of the Center for Climate and Security, John Conger, to see us out uh, for some final concluding thoughts. Thanks all. Thanks, Kate. Um, and, and thanks to everybody for joining us here today. I think this has been an exceptional conversation uh, with some fantastic and uh, bright uh, intellectual lights to, to share with us their thoughts on, uh, on a very, very important issue and a, and a very rapidly changing issue. I, I, I was struck and I wanted to highlight one thought that uh, Ambassador Krutnis uh, pointed out in, in her comments, which was uh, the Arctic is not remote to them. It is uh, home to a large percentage of their population. The Arctic is not remote to the Arctic nations. And, and I think that that is a, a telling and important point because it's not going to be remote as, the, as climate change is driving uh, significant temperature increases in the region uh, much faster than the rest of the world. I think the Arctic is not going to be remote to many nations and it's not going to be just the folks who uh, and the nations that, that have territory there that are going to have interests. Uh, you're going to see a region that is not only less remote, but it is going to be more populated, it's going to be more active, um, and, and you're going to see uh, less isolation. And so uh, as we think about the changing environment, you're going to have a changing security environment. And, and so the, my, my sort of last thought would be uh, in, in President Biden's executive order, he said that uh, climate change was going to be an essential element of foreign policy and national security. And I think that it's important to, to, to sort of edit that a little and say climate change is an essential element of national security and foreign policy in the Arctic. It is inextricably linked. And I think if we, if we wanted to have any takeaway from this conversation today, we know that uh, no matter what the institution is and no matter what the issue is, that uh, foreign policy and national security are inextricably linked to climate change in, in the Arctic. So with that, uh, thank you again for everybody for joining us today. I wanna give special thanks to Ambassador Hillman, Ambassador Krutnis, uh, to Sue Vinias, and of course, to Sherry Goodman for being such a leader on this issue and for uh, bringing us all here together today. So thank you again and, and have a great Friday. Bye now.